know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer. And hi, my name is Aaron from the show Reeducation, and hopefully, Radical Reviewer and I can take a look at this text and get some interesting insight into exactly what it is about. Wait, what do you mean? Well, no, I feel fine. Oh, yeah, no, I just forgot to put on stage makeup this morning. Eh, you look okay to me. Anyway, today we're taking a look at How Nonviolence Protects the State by Peter Gerdelus, South End Press, 2007. The key idea of this text is to critique our historical understanding of pacifism, of nonviolent protest. We tend to think of nonviolent protests as being successful. The Indian independence movement, civil rights movement, anti-war movement, etc., etc. However, this text argues that when discussing this history, we ignore the larger power dynamics that were at play. We fail to address the role of other groups fighting in the struggle. Groups who committed violence, or threatened violence. These groups made the pacifists' demands seem like the lesser of two evils from the perspective of those in power. Because of our omission of these groups, and our inaccurate understanding of their successfulness, pacifism has become the dominant form of protest, with no massive violent or violence-threatening movements to act as a counterweight. This text argues that our modern-day pacifism is simply a pressure valve to let an enraged public blow off steam while actual changes to the status quo never occur. This is actually really true, and I completely agree with this statement. It's something I talk about quite a bit on my channel. Gelder Luz looks at pacifism as a way for the state to monopolize power into the hands of the elites, while giving the people only the illusion of control or autonomy. It's a kind of performative rebellion, the Coke Zero of activism, if you will. It looks, feels, smells, and tastes just like a revolution, without any of that pesky change or reform. Gelder Luz believes it makes for a toothless movement with a neutered goal. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Firstly, in the intro, Gerda Luce summarizes the text thusly. This book will show that nonviolence in its current manifestations is based on falsified histories of struggle. Gerda Luce continues, We are advocates of a diversity of tactics, meaning effective combinations drawn from a full range of tactics that might lead to liberation from all the components of this oppressive system. The author Chris Hedges has critiqued diversity of tactics, saying that it is a foolish excuse for rash behavior against the state which we stand no chance of fighting in violent altercations. Hedges argues that if we really wanted to change things, we must change them peacefully, and he looks to the fall of the Berlin Wall as an example of this, that overwhelming public support made the military suppression impossible because members of the military knew many people who were involved in the protest and so military suppression of the protest couldn't be implemented. You know, I hate to admit it, because I actually agree with Christopher Hedges on a lot of things, and I highly respect his work, but on this front, I believe he's being a bit naive. Obviously, waging an all-out war against the state may or may not prove to be fruitful, but the idea that we can expect the state to make fundamental changes within itself because I happen to snap my fingers in the free speech zone is completely absurd. We have to take revolution seriously, so says the guy that looks like a pug. Anyway, if we're not able to believe that our system can do simple things that are baked into the Constitution, like, I don't know, holding a democratic election without massive amounts of fraud, then why do we think that protesting in this way would do anything at all? The truth is that the system is going to do whatever it possibly can to sustain itself. It's not going to allow some reforms to come in and change everything. And it's certainly not going to change anything if all we're doing is standing there chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, crony capitalism's got to go. It's on its face, naive. Agreed. Though I like Hedge's analysis on many things, when he plays horseshoe theory with black bloc and reactionary terrorist groups, my eyes roll out of my head. I've found that both overwhelming popular support and violent resistance have been successful. 
Nonviolent groups with popular support have walked onto bases, disarmed troops, and taken over the bases that way. And strategic people's armies have fought their way into bases and taken them over that way. Nonviolent groups like the Occupy movement have changed public discourse around inequality. And militant groups like the Black Panther Party have implemented programs that have created societal change that way. This tells me that it's not about wholly accepting or rejecting violence or nonviolence, but instead realizing that options have to be taken on a case by case basis, and so we need a diversity of tactics. Gelderloos concludes the introduction thusly. An ideal revolutionary activist would not be one who obsessively focuses on fighting cops or engaging in clandestine acts of sabotage, but one who embraces and supports these activities, where effective, as one portion of a broad range of actions needed to overthrow the state and build a better world. Chapter 1. Nonviolence is Ineffective to start, Gerdelus looks for flaws in what have historically been considered the successes of nonviolence, namely British colonial rule, caps on the nuclear arms race, the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and the peace movement during the war against Vietnam. Exactly. All of which being examples of where external factors such as violence, coercion, national interest, and expense along with a peace movement were what ended those things. But history is whitewashed to appear like nonviolence was solely responsible for any progress made in the last 50 years. This completely disregards the fact that there are a myriad of factors involved in any conflict. No one tactic is ever responsible for changing everything. To think that it would is reductive and myopic. Gelderloos goes on to argue, The pacifist position requires that the success must be attributed to pacifist tactics and pacifist tactics alone. It's easy to see where this line of logic is going. If any societal change can be shown to have been motivated by pacifism and another form of action, then chances are that both actions were needed for success. Hence, pacifism on its own is not enough and we need a diversity of tactics. An argument I've often made is that once the dominant narrative takes hold of a movement, basic aspects of that movement change. For example, the civil rights movement lost its ability to demand economic change that would have secured real racial equality. The anti-war movement lost its ability to demand the changes to the military-industrial complex that would have made future imperialist wars impossible. And in this same way, Gelderloos argues that Gandhi was only so popular because the British press allowed it to be so. Essentially, pacifist leaders are held up by the dominant class as acceptable alternatives to the more radical demands of the movement in question. We see that the dominant class makes this distinction with all movements, Vegan options at the grocery store is okay. Animal liberation is not. Gay marriage and rainbow corporate logos are okay, but adequate services available for people seeking transitioning or for LGBT plus folks who are ostracized from their families is not. Having a black president or chief of police is okay. Total restructuring of the prison industrial complex and war on drugs and other aspects of what's called the new Jim Crow is not. Gelderloos demonstrates that the largest perceived pacifist victories were, taken as a whole, not strictly pacifist, and in fact had many individuals and groups in the movement that were not pacifists. From here, Gelderloos then asks us to look at the anti-Iraq war protests. The anti-Iraq war protests, using the false history of pacifism's supposed victories, were almost exclusively non-violent. And not only this, they were some of the largest demonstrations in the world. And yet, the invasion happened, a 10-year U.S. occupation of Iraq happened, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis were murdered, and so we see how effective this pacifist protest was. Gelderloos then gives the example of Jews in World War II. This type of example always makes me feel uncomfortable. I think it's unfair to the victims of the Holocaust to assume that they should have risked the safety of their children and loved ones in a violent uprising against the Nazis. Luckily, rather than victim blaming, this text simply congratulates those who did respond violently, namely the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Gelderloos concludes the chapter saying, In the Holocaust, and less extreme examples from India to Birmingham, nonviolence failed to sufficiently empower its practitioners 
whereas the use of a diversity of tactics got results. Put simply, if a movement is not a threat, it cannot change a system based on centralized coercion and violence. And if that movement does not realize and exercise the power that makes it a threat, it cannot destroy such a system. I actually have some conflicting feelings about this. On one hand, this chapter lays out how pacifism is insufficient, and I would totally agree with this. It would seem to me that, throughout history, pacifism has been solely incapable of handling any sort of reform on its own. But on the other hand, I still don't think that it would be useful for us to go full propaganda of the deed or start assassinating innocent people, though I don't believe that was the author's intent either. A diversity of tactics is what we need here, and diversity is just that, diverse. The people need to be clever and use all methods available to them, not just sitting around in a prayer circle singing kumbaya and hoping things will get better, and not just simply resorting to wanton destruction, immediately. One should always pick and choose strategy carefully. Different strategies call for different tactics, and every situation is going to be different, so you have to come prepared. Like I always say, hope for peace, but prepare for war. Chapter 2, Nonviolence is Racist. This chapter is about how white pacifist culture selectively celebrates pacifist leaders while ignoring the successes of other unsavory activists. And to add insult to injury, first world pacifists living in nonviolent circumstances are demanding that people in the third world and people living in the ghettos and inner cities of the first world, people who live in violent circumstances, the pacifists demand that these people be nonviolent in response to their repression. Gelderloo states, Nonviolence is an inherently privileged position in the modern context. Besides the fact that the typical pacifist is quite clearly white and middle class, pacifism as an ideology comes from a privileged context. It ignores that violence is already here. Look around you. Do you see violence? Maybe. Maybe not. Have you been stopped and frisked? Have you been violently evicted from your home or violently removed from where you were staying while homeless? Have you been threatened by police for walking while black? Have you been detained or are you at risk of being detained in an ICE concentration camp? Do you live in a country at risk of US drone strike? This capitalist society is maintained by violence. This is probably the most perplexing part to understand, but the truth is that most of these privileged people don't actually recognize the systemic violence as violence. It's like looking at life through your windshield. You know that outside your car is real, but you're protected from it. You're isolated from it. People see the police shootings on the news, but they believe that it's just normal. They ignore the millions of homeless people. They accept the prison population. They forget all about the wars. All of this systemic violence is seen as worthless people getting what they deserve. Being able to sit comfortably behind that windshield dulls their empathy for those in society suffering that violence. Gelderloos then argues that if pacifism is the best and most perfect and effective tactic, then Native Americans could have used it to thwart genocide, and black folks could have used it to thwart chattel slavery. These are obviously ludicrous claims. Respectability politics? Capitulating to bigots? That ain't it, chief. Looking at the role of privilege in our movements, Gelderloos states, Nonviolence requires that activists attempt to influence the power structure, which requires that they approach it, which means that privileged people who have better access to power will retain control of any movement as the gatekeepers and intermediaries, who allows the masses to speak truth to power. Gelderloos elaborates more about the whitewashing of history and recuperation of activists. He states that they make frequent usage of race by taking activists of color out of their context and selectively using them as spokespersons for non-violence. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. are turned into representatives for all people of color to follow. The establishment has this way of whitewashing history or sanitizing and sterilizing movements to make the state look good. This, for lack of a better word, performance, dramatizes dissent and creates the illusion that our so-called democratic government is not actually just elitist or authoritarian. 
This is nothing more than a way of convincing the masses that you can change the system by sitting in a circle singing kumbaya and holding hands. And all this mentality does is passivizes the people. There's no other way to say this. A population unwilling to use a diversity of tactics is just simply easier to control. Gilderloos then argues, at first, nonviolence seems like a clear moral position that has little to do with race. This view is based on the simplistic assumption that violence is first and foremost something that we choose. Because a diversity of tactics is so demonized in the news and in other media, Peter warns that of course proponents of militancy must understand that there is a great need for caution when discussing tactics, especially via email, and I would go further to say anything online, especially social media. And we face a massive hurdle of building support for actions that are more likely to get us harassed or imprisoned, even if all we do is just discuss them. Peter believes that most of these privileged upper-class people have absolutely no need for militant action because they don't feel that same systemic violence as their less privileged counterparts. This actually leads people who could have been our allies to try to prevent more militant groups from using successful tactics to win because those privileged people see it as either unnecessary or possibly detrimental to their own well-being. He goes on to say that because of the weighty self-interest of white people in preventing revolutionary uprisings in their own backyard, there has been a long history of betrayal by white pacifists who have condemned and abandoned revolutionary groups to the state. And worse still, they encouraged that state repression and claimed that the revolutionaries in fact deserved it by engaging in militant resistance. Chapter 3, Nonviolence is Statist. This chapter is about how nonviolence protects the state. Essentially, pacifists do the state's work by pacifying the opposition in advance. Gelderloos describes how pacifists often claim that the state wants protesters to be violent so that they can justify violent state repression, and that this is why the state has agent provocateurs who encourage violent protest. And yeah, agent provocateurs, COINTELPRO, etc. have been proven to exist, However, as we've seen, the state will respond with violence whether the protest is violent or not. And so I'm left to conclude that the state is doing what the protesters should do. They're using a diversity of tactics. The state responds passively when it's convenient for them to do so, and it responds violently when it's convenient for them to do so. The opposition to the state should make similar judgments. Actually, this is really quite interesting. This chapter explains quite well why I believe centrists and liberals actually condemn the violence by their own people against their oppressors, but condone violence from those same oppressors on their allies. Peter talks about an FBI memo from way back in 1971, where the state expressed, quote, the need to go about discrediting militant blacks in the eyes of the responsible Negro community and the white community. This shows both how the state can count on knee-jerk pacifist condemnation of violence and how pacifists effectively do the state's dirty work by failing to use their cultural influence to make militant resistance to tyranny respectable. Instead, pacifists claim that militancy alienates people and do nothing to attempt to counteract this phenomenon. In essence, pacifists basically allow the state to just have a monopoly on violence. Like, perhaps you could say, nonviolence protects the state. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Gelderloos then critiques the common claim that pacifism ensures that the protesters' message will be intact, when in reality, the corporate media will never report the protests' message. In fact, the Occupy movement is a perfect example of this. The Occupy movement was a global protest with a simple message about inequality. 99% versus the 1%. And yet the news either wasn't reporting at all, or when it became obvious that the news had to say something about it, it kept reporting about how the encampments were hurting local businesses, or that most of the protesters were actually homeless people and not protesters at all, and other BS like that. And in the end, as we know, the encampments faced violent police repression anyway. <laughs> 
Interestingly enough, pacifists actually tend to fall into a rather frequent contradiction when accepting state violence. In practice, pacifist morality demonstrates that it is more acceptable for radicals to rely on the violence of the government for protection than to defend themselves. But this just simply puts the violence into the hands of the state, actively granting the state that same monopoly of violence. He goes on to explain that part of this theater of pacifism is the idea of protesting the military, something that has the illusion of activism without ever really having any real effect. He states, A colorful, conscientious, passive protest in front of a military base only improves the PR image of the military. For surely, only a just and humane military would tolerate protests outside of its front gates. Such a protest is like a flower stuck in the barrel of a gun. It does nothing to impede the ability of that gun to fire. He goes on to say something that I've stated many times in the past. What people don't seem to understand is that free speech doesn't do anything to empower us. It does not equal freedom. Free speech is nothing more than just another privilege that was granted to us by the government. And it's just as easily taken away, just like any number of any of our other rights or freedoms. That's how things like the military, or prison, or wage slavery under a capitalist even exist. All of it is just another form of taking away your liberty, your freedom, your bodily autonomy, and putting those things into the hands and control of the state and business. The state, and in that I do include business, has the uncontested power to take away any of your rights, and history has done nothing but shown that they exercise that power all the time. Chapter 4, Nonviolence is Patriarchal The standard claim is that violence is patriarchal because men are generally stronger and more aggressive than women. However, Gelderloos claims that it is pacifism that is patriarchal because it refuses to permit oppressed groups, women for example, from committing violence against their violent oppressors. Can I get a armed trans women? Or how about a kill your local rapist? Gelderloos argues, most of the work needed to overcome patriarchy will probably be peaceful, focused on healing and building alternatives. But a pacifist practice that forbids the use of any other tactics leaves no option for people who need to protect themselves from violence now. Gilderloos then quotes several violent female activists, cis females, trans females, and female people of color in the US and abroad. The chapter ends by looking at the biological determinism argument that some people, many who call themselves feminists, use to say that violence is inherently masculine and pacifism is inherently feminine. This argument is embarrassing because it instills the same biological determinism that feminism seeks to overthrow. And also, this argument ignores all the women who have fought back and protected themselves and loved ones. Chapter 5, Nonviolence is Tactically and Strategically Inferior. This chapter critiques the strategies of nonviolent movements. Gelderloos claims that the four major types of pacifist strategies are the morality play, the lobbying approach, the creation of alternatives, and generalized disobedience. Gelderloos addresses and debunks each strategy, for example arguing that the lobbying approach is ineffective because it capitulates to the corrupt system that is actively against our aims. Not to mention that the lobbying approach relies on having access and the ability to navigate the halls of power which is something that wealthier white folks will have more access to. Chapter 6, Nonviolence is Diluted This chapter is very similar to Derek Jensen's list of pacifist fallacies, which I discussed in my review of Endgame. Things like violence only begets violence, or that violence never solved anything. Things that sound like reasonable truisms, but totally crumble under scrutiny. So I recommend checking out that video if you'd like to know more about that. And lastly, Chapter 7, The Alternative Possibilities for Revolutionary Activism. Gelderloos argues that when we put all political action under the same tactics and strategies, then it is easy for powerful groups to co-opt the movement's message, as he demonstrated with the so-called pacifist victories of the past. India's fight for independence fell short. 
the civil rights movement's economic demands were not met. The peace movement's anti-military industrial complex demands were ignored. The so-called successes of these movements were strictly the successes that the dominant class tolerated. Next, Gelderloos explains the goals for a successful movement, namely revolutionary change, involving destruction of centralized or hierarchical power and local communities autonomously deciding for themselves how to be organized. Gelderloos ends the text arguing that, in all, we must not fool ourselves into thinking this fight will be easy or that power will back down peacefully. He states, we must realistically accept that revolution is a social war. Not because we like war, but because we recognize that the status quo is a low intensity war and challenging the state results in an intensification of that warfare. Conclusion So what's my conclusion to this whole book? Well, I've spoken about the benefits of nonviolent action in the past and I do stand by all of those statements. I still don't necessarily believe it's good optics to start setting fires or punching Nazis. Like I said, punching Nazis feels really good, but it's better to punch the message. At the same time though, I can't just come away from all of these arguments and facts thinking to myself that a diversity of tactics isn't sometimes necessary because it is. Throughout the entirety of human history, the most important revolutionary events have been achieved through a diversity of tactics, and relegating yourself to one set of ideas just inherently neuters the movement. If there are workers being exploited, or prisoners forced into slavery, or climate change threatens to kill us all, and some groups believe it's necessary to use diverse tactics like I don't know, impeding movement across a bridge, or cutting a lock to shut down a pipeline, you know, inherently violent activities. It's the position of the author, and by extension, me, that we shouldn't just condemn those tactics because we don't agree with them. To do so sounds a little bit too much like a vanguard to me. Instead, you could just simply say that you can't speak to the motives that were used by that group but it's so much more important for all of us to stress that the far greater violence that could ever have been committed is being done by the state when they enslave those prisoners or they pump that oil. Remember, I'm not saying that we should just run out and start smashing windows on the Goldman Sachs building or loading fash into a trebuchet to launch them at Trump Tower. But I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things either. I mean, this whole bit is basically just several layers of irony hidden underneath a dog persona. Speaking of which, has anybody else been hearing dog whistles throughout this video? Yeah? No? Ah, maybe it's just me. What I am saying though, is that peacefully singing in the free speech zone will not make change. What do you think, doggo? As we've demonstrated, this text is about how pacifist victories were overstated and owe their success to their more radical compatriots, and that these pacifist shortcomings can be overcome by using a diversity of tactics. I first reviewed this book at the start of 2017, a few weeks before Richard Spencer was punched, several months before the Unite the Right rally, a year before Trump's family separation policy and the expansion of concentration camps in the US, two years before the neo-Nazi Christchurch shooting and two and a half years before Comrade Willem von Spronson's heroic attack of ICE detainment vehicles. And as of this recording, we are mere hours from the right-wing terrorist shooting in El Paso, Texas. When I first read this book, I had a very simple mindset. The police would not have wantonly pepper sprayed and clubbed the Occupy movement protesters if the left had a gun culture in which one could safely assume that protesters were armed. Now, almost a decade later, and seeing the steep rise in reactionary and neo-Nazi violence around the world, and the steep rise in reactionary and neo-Nazi political officials, I'm left thinking something very different. The devastating effects of climate change will continue to worsen if capitalism is not stopped. The effects of climate change, worsening droughts and famine and hurricanes and tsunamis, etc., will cause refugee crises all around the world. If the proponents of white nationalism and reactionary racism are allowed to control the debate around the coming ecological refugee crises, the future looks incredibly grim. If, however, we use a diversity of tactics, if we support the actions of environmental activists ranging from promoting energy alternatives to the destruction of corporate infrastructure, 
If we support Antifa actions ranging from educating the public to exposing neo-Nazi groups to punching Nazis and the heroic destruction of ICE infrastructure, then we may live to see a world worth living in. We may lay the groundwork for building the new world that we see in our hearts. And as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. Elsa Turner Gibb, Arian Nam, Camila Danaher, Edward Cruz, Emmanuel VT, Jan Waterman, Jasper Den Odin, Jiggly Puffer, Callie, Linux Powered Communism, LS, Mad Blender, Mara Penguin, My Fake Name, Nick, Odin Sayer, Leitonota Bui, Only Dognose, P.D. Morin, Paint Eater, Red Platius, Spencer Clark, Susie O, Tammy Aaron, The Fool, The Surfs, Tony Harrison, and Uncultivated Identity. And if you're interested in supporting me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash radicalreviewer. Oh, and thank you very much, Radical Reviewer, for having me on your channel. It's been an absolute joy. I can't seem to figure out why I turned into a pug, but uh, apparently it somehow fit the bit. So that's fantastic. If anybody does get a chance, please, please support Radical Reviewer. I mean, hit that little subscribe button, click the stupid fucking bell, do all those things. Give this guy some likes because he definitely deserves it. And for more fun punk anarchist stuff, come check out my channel, Reeducation. Though, usually I'm a little bit less canine. Hope to see you there. And thank you, Aaron, for helping me tackle this text. I knew, based on your wonderful work on How to Revolution, that you were just the comrade to ask for reviewing this text. And to you viewers, if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the Radical Review. Thanks for watching. A Nazi worked out today. Did you? But that said, we live in interesting times. Times that suggest a need for self-defense. So I recommend joining your local Socialist Rifle Association, or Huey P. Newton Gun Club, or John Brown Gun Club, or National African American Gun Association, or any other leftist group focused on self-defense. Stay safe out there, comrades.